Hi everyone, welcome to our talk. And today we are going to talk about various aspects of physical simulation and AI, and especially on the differentiability aspect of how to do differential physics and how does it help artificial intelligence. I am Yue Minghu from MIT CCL. I am a fourth year PhD student there. So before we start, let me briefly introduce what is forward physics simulation. Let's say you have a basketball, you want to throw it. In this very simple case, let's assume we have zero drag. You can accurately predict the final position after time t, x sub t, uh, as a function of various physical parameters. In this simple case, you can have a very simple analytical solution for the final position. However, the practical problems are often harder, and it's often not possible to solve analytically. So that's why people usually use numerical integration to move forward in time and do some prediction. Real-world physical simulation is usually more complex, and uh, here we have uh, three water wells interacting with water, and this is a SIGGRAPH 2018 paper that we did. And we can use the same simulator for simulating a robot, and uh, by doing this, we can validate which robot design moves faster than the other, we can pick the optimal design without actually manufacturing the robot, which accelerates the development of, uh, of robots. And sometimes physical simulation can actually scale to very, very large scale. And here is a simulation of over 100 million particles. As you can see, a lot of Tai Chi letters falling down. And uh, Tai Chi is a programming language that I'm going to dive into later a little bit. So that's for forward simulation. What is backward simulation? Um, it's actually pretty pretty easy as well. So before we start doing backward simulation, it's important to define it's important to define a loss function. And here, let's define loss function to be something like uh, the square distance between the target position x t star and the final position uh, x t. So after defining loss function, one natural question to ask is. Is it possible for us to somehow compute the partial derivative of L with respect to X0 and uh, partial L with respect to partial V0? And it's actually not hard. You can just use the chain rule, or some people call it backpropagation or reverse mode auto diff. And uh, by doing this, you can just accumulate the gradients all the way back from the final state to the initial state. And then one important application is to use the gradient. Uh, to do some optimization so that you can somehow align xt and xt star. Basically, that means moving the basketball into the basket. So apparently, differential physics is not new, and gradients of simulation for optimization is well studied in computational physics and mechanic engineering for many years, actually. And recently, the ML community is very interested in somehow combining differential physics and artificial intelligence. And the key to achieve this is to develop various differentiable time integrators so that you can have a time series of simulation. And somehow, the time series of, inter uh, of simulation can interact with neural networks or other deep learning modules. You can combine them in whatever manner you want. And the time integrators have two families. The first family is what we call explicit time integrator, one example being symplectic Euler. Uh, in this kind of time integrator, using normal reverse mode auto differentiation usually gives you reasonable behavior. Sometimes, maybe because the system is too stiff, you have to use an implicit time integrator, or you're just solving for a quasi-static state. In those cases, you have to leverage the adjoint methods. And uh, uh, basically, the adjoint methods are doing differentiation under constraints. The constraints are usually linear or nonlinear system to solve. Gradients of simulation is well studied. In mechanical engineering, one typical example is what we call topology optimization. And uh, there is a very well written book on this. But for today, I'm just going to talk about a very basic concept of topology optimization. So by doing topology optimization, you are distributing limited material in a structure to minimize deformation under external load. Um, and then, of course, you need to somehow use a, the adjoint method to compute the partial derivative of the loss function to the topology. Here, we have to use the adjoint method because you, you have to uh, solve for the displacement under the external load, which is a linear system solve. And uh, here, I'm showing you a bird big topology optimization example. Uh, I'm showing the uh, optimization process from the initial guess 
to the final optimized structure. As you can see, this gradient-based optimization can really be powerful and uh, it gives you very fine detailed structure within this bird big structure. That's for differentiable physics for more classical applications. Today, the focus is going to be differentiable physics plus AI. So if something like this work, what, what can we do? We can do a lot of things. We can somehow learn neural network controllers much faster than reinforcement learning. This is really attractive. And we can do robotic topology and actuation co-design, which means you're not only optimizing for the controller, but also optimizing the uh, robot, robot geometry. We can also do system identification that somehow measures physical properties of a module in your robot by watching a video. You can even try to reduce the same rail gap by hybridizing simulators and learning because now you can uh, hybridizing simulation modules and deep neural networks into a single system and train it end to end. So before we start, it's actually there are actually a lot of questions to, questions to ask. Clearly, there are many issues to address because this is a relatively new combination, but today I'm going to focus on three questions. The first one is what happens on more complex systems in longer time horizon? Previously we just saw like if you, if you just threw a basketball or you're solving for a quasi static state under external load, differential physics works pretty well. But what if the system gets more complex or you have thousands of time steps, you have a very long time horizon? The second question we have to address is practically how do we actually write a differentiable simulator? This is a really big productivity issue because there doesn't seem to be a good tool for you to write a differential physical simulator. We'll come back to it in a minute. Finally, how does a differential phys simulator run efficiently? Um, do we have an existing framework that allows it to run very performantly, uh, run very efficiently, or not? Uh, clearly, the answer is no, otherwise I won't be raising this question. So let's now talk about the first question, which is what if we have more steps and more complex system? The natural question to, ha to ask here is do long time horizon simulation gradients even make sense? Because you know the world is chaotic. What if for a simple system it's easy to somehow evaluate the gradients, but what, what if we add more frictional contact? What if we have thousands of degrees of freedoms? What if we have elastoplastic deformation? And in order to make it work, or in order to make it meaningful for AI, we have to somehow introduce actuators and we have to plug in neural network controllers. All of those factors are introducing a lot of noise or chaotic behavior to the system. We have this famous Lawrence attractor example here. As you can see, uh, sometimes people call it butterfly effect, meaning the end result of a simulator can be very, very sensitive to the initial configuration of the system. Uh, in other words, the physical world can be very chaotic. So if you represent the computational graph of a differential physical simulator plus neural networks, you will end up a graph with billions of nodes. If you look at this graph, let's say we have 2,000 time steps, and in each time step, we have a bunch of physical states, and then we feed the physical states to your neural network controllers. In the controllers, we evaluate, let's say, two fully connected layers, and then the controller gives you a control output, which you can consider as the actuation to the system. You feed the actuation to the differentiable simulation, and then uh, usually a differentiable simulation can have thousands of mathematical operators, and uh, it's not hard to end up with tens of millions of nodes in a computational graph. Is this graph still numerically stable when evaluating the gradient? And uh, the second question to ask is, um, running this graph on an existing system such as TensorFlow, is it going to be efficient? So uh, those are really interesting questions. And uh, that's why we developed this Chen Queen simulator. Uh, this is a paper at ACRA 2019. We proved that it's actually numerically stable. The, the gradients are actually good enough for optimization, which is a great news. And secondly, we find that existing systems such as TensorFlow isn't efficient enough for differential physics. Uh, essentially, in Chain Queen, you can somehow use the gradients to do a lot of optimization to make your robot move in your desired direction. Chain Queen is a differential physical simulator for deformable objects. So this is pretty attractive because nowadays a lot of people are very interested in soft robotics where every part of the robot can actually deform in an elastic manner. The Chain Queen physics engine is based on the recently proposed moving least squares material point method, which is, in, which is a 
a simplified and more efficient version of material point method in graphics. Unfortunately, when we were doing chain queen, we didn't get a very powerful tool that gives us both performance and uh, gradient evaluation. So we have to manually derive all the gradients on and on and implement the kernels using CUDA, which is not really pleasant. So if you look at a single simulation step of chain queen, it's basically just a uh, user material point method simulation for the forward, you just uh, do particle to grid, grid operation and grid your particle. For backward, you're just uh, executing all the kernels in a reverse manner so that you can accumulate the gradients from the final state to the initial state. The whole simulator can have uh, usually hundreds or thousands of time steps. We implemented everything using CUDA on GPU. And let me show some applications. Here's a system identification example. Let's say we have two balls, A and B, and A collides into B. And then you have the observation that B ends up with C. And we're trying to solve what is the relative density of A and B. Initially, if you set the density to be one, then unfortunately, there's not enough momentum after the collision for B to reach destination C. So after a few rounds of gradient descent optimization, uh, you may end up with a relative density 2.26, um, which gives B enough momentum after the collision to hit the destination C. So as you can see, by using ingredients, we can know how to adjust the relative density of two balls and then end up with a reasonable guess. Maybe more interestingly, we can use the gradients to optimize controllers. And here we are optimizing uh, a four leg 3D robot, as you can see, uh, each leg of the robot has four actuators and the actuators are elastic and it can either contract or expand. And by somehow uh, contracting and expanding the elastic muscles, you can somehow just uh, move, make your robot move forward. This is a simple 2D example. We have two legs and uh, each leg has two actuators. Let me just show you, uh, show you how the optimization actually happens. This is iteration zero. And as you can see in the very beginning, the robot does nothing. And after 30 gradient descent iterations, the movement already starts to make sense. It's moving very slowly to the right. And after just 58 iterations, you can see it's moving and jumping very happily to the right. So this kind of, this is actually very efficient learning process, computer reinforcement learning. Here I'm showing 58 iterations of the optimization process. As you can see, starting from iteration zero, it's not making progress. But after just um, 58 iterations, it's starting to behave very uh, smartly just by brute force gradient descent. So this is a 3D quadruped runner example. And uh, it has four legs and 16 actuators. The same thing, zero iteration, 50 iterations, and then 120. Finally, 200 iterations. You can see this cute robot jumping to the right. And here's a robotic armor example, still optimized using uh, gradient descent, and then the, the controllers are neural networks. You can see it's very rapidly to learn to reach the blue destination uh, using its tip. Here's an open loop controller example with a crawler, and the crawler is just uh, uh, crawling on the ground to move to the right. As you can see, uh, surprisingly, even with an open loop controller, the learning can happen very smoothly, and uh, it actually takes only 14 iterations to move, uh, to make it to learn to move. Here's a relatively quantitative example where we compare our gradient, brute force gradient descent against the state of the art uh, reinforcement learning algorithm by that, by that time. And you can see it's almost one order of magnitude faster convergence. As I mentioned, sometimes it's meaningful to co-design the robotic geometry or uh, elastic behavior and uh, actuation sequence. Here you can see uh, we are designing a robotic arm with different Young's modulus on different regions. And as you can see, uh, by combining the optimization of uh, Young's modulus and the actuation sequence, it can learn to somehow reach the destination. 
without a Young's modulus optimization, reaching the destination will be very, very hard in this case. So uh, our conclusion in this work is that gradient descent really works, and the, the gradients can be really stable. And regarding performance, we find something very interesting, which is handwritten CUDA, which is a lot of engineering, actually runs over 100 times faster than other systems such as TensorFlow. So this is not, maybe not surprising, but a very uh, important message during this work. I'll talk about why TensorFlow is slower in a moment, but now let's just focus on a high-level view of this problem. So you have a trade-off between productivity and performance in developing different physical simulators. You can either abuse TensorFlow, or you can handwrite CUDA kernels, and you cannot get the, the both words, uh, the benefits of both words. Like TensorFlow gives you auto dif differentiation, but it's very slow for writing simulation. Uh, CUDA kernels are high performance, but you have to derive the gradients manually, which is a really painful pro process. The question is, is there a way for us to somehow easily write high performance differentiable simulators? Well, in order to solve this question, let's first discuss why is TensorFlow not suitable for writing differentiable simulators? The answer is easy because it's not designed for physical simulator. Instead, it's designed for uh, deep learning. And deep learning and simulators have very different computational patterns. So for example, uh, physical simulators tend to use densos or gathering scattering operations. It tends to have fine-grained branching and loops. So those constructs are pretty common in simulator, but they are not easy to implement efficiently in array or tensor-based languages such as NumPy or TensorFlow. So now we know the reason why TensorFlow is not good because it's not suitable for, it's not even designed for physical simulator. So the solution is clearly, we need to design a new system for physical simulator. That's why we developed the Tai Chi programming language. Uh, we published the result on Stick of Asia 2019. And essentially, Tai Chi is a high-performance domain-specific language embedded in Python. And we have a JIT compiler written in C++. It has uh, multiple backends, you can write Tai Chi code in Python and then it will run it on multi-thread CPU or GPU, just as TensorFlow. Tai Chi is more specifically designed for graphics simulation and more exotic AI applications. I mean, those AI components that cannot be easily implemented using TensorFlow. Usually you have to write CUDA, um, manually write CUDA kernels for those uh, operators in TensorFlow, but in Tai Chi, it's very easy to write those. And one defining feature of Tai Chi compared to TensorFlow is what we call programmable mega kernels. Those programmable mega kernels allows programmers to write high performance kernels using just Python. And then more importantly, those mega kernels maps to a single CUDA kernel on the GPU. That ensures that uh, we're having very high arithmetic intensity meaning we're doing more flaws per byte. So apparently, uh, Tai Chi was not differentiable, so we implemented or developed a different system, which we call Diff Tai Chi. That's a differentiable programming extension on Tai Chi. And this work was published at ITR 2020. In Diff Tai Chi, uh, we can easily mass product high-performance differential simulators in a language that is very similar to Python. So uh, this kind of mass production proves that the language has very high productivity. Recall that previously in Chain Queen, we were using CUDA, and that was not very productive. And in fact, we easily wrote 10 different differential simulators using Diff Tai Chi. So here are just three examples. I'm just, uh, I'll show more demos later. So the Tai Chi compiler is a standalone compiling system. Basically, starting from Python script, we lower all the way down to uh, executable kernels on parallel devices. As you can see, we have a pretty um, complex compilation workflow that progressively lowers the Python, high-level Python kernel into a low-level executable code. The key de language design features of Diff Tai Chi are differentiable, imperative, mega kernel, and parallel. So apparently, we need things to be differentiable so that uh, those systems can be used in deep neural networks. And uh, differentiability is one of the key features of deep learning. And 
imperative is more um, targeted to physical simulation because people have been using imperative languages such as C and Fortran for writing simulator for decades and we don't want to uh, enforce people to use a functional language to write simulator that is less practical and mega kernels and parallelism ensures that we can run the kernels very efficiently by using diff tai chi uh, we can write shorter code which actually 4.2x shorter code compared to hand engineered CUDA partly because now the gradients are evaluated automatically by the Tai Chi compiler. You do not have to manually derive the gradient, which is really tedious and error prone. And it also runs over 100 times faster than TensorFlow just because we are now uh, more tailored for the computational patterns in simulation. In TensorFlow, it may be the case that you waste over 90% of your time just launching kernels or reading, uh, reading from main memory. Please check out our paper for more details on performance and more evaluations. So here's a high-level view of two-scale autodiff in diff tai chi. So we designed our autodiff system to be two-scale because we really want our kernels to be mega kernels, and uh, we use a tape to record the uh, mega kernel launches. And, the, and then within the mega kernels, we do a source code transform so that a mega kernel's gradient kernel is still a mega kernel. This ensures that uh, during gradient evaluation, we are still running high performance kernels. Of course, there are many related work. Each of them are doing a great job in their own field. But for physical simulation, diff tai chi is, is, is the only system so far we know that uh, uh, serves all the d features of simulation. If you use other system, it's likely that you are going to miss one or two the requirement of physical simulation. And diff tai chi is really designed and tailored for writing differentiable physical simulators. So let's come back to this figure. And uh, diff tai chi allows programmers to easily build differentiable physical modules that works in deep neural networks. And the whole program can be end-to-end -end differentiable. Actually, for this, if you write this computational graph in TensorFlow, it's very easy to end up with millions of operators. And uh, sometimes TensorFlow can stay for minutes or even tens of minutes just to compile the computational graph. But in Diff Tai Chi, you don't have that issue. It's just because ten TensorFlow is more designed for deep neural networks and uh, it's unlikely that a deep neural network can have a million operators, but it's very common in simulation. So the computational patterns are really different in two frameworks. Here's a reproduction of the 2D simulation example. You can actually write this um, simulator in within 200 lines of code, I believe. And uh, uh, of course, Diff Tai Chi is open source. Every demo I show in this talk can actually be reproduced with a single Python script. You're free to check out the code and then run it on your own to have fun. Here's a 3D version. And then <laughs> for some reason, it's learning to uh, moving to the, to the right in a weird manner. We can also add some water to make the robot's life harder. And clearly, uh, it does move less quick. Uh, when there is water interacting with the elastic material. So here's a mass spring system simulation, and uh, the mass spring robot will learn to move to the right. And we use a closed loop neural network controller. Here are th uh, two rigid body robots. In this example, we optimize for an initial velocity field so that the fluid simulation forms a Tai Chi pattern after 100 time steps. Oh, this is my favorite one. So we are combining the differentiable water wave simulator with a differentiable water renderer. And then we feed the simulated and render result into VGG16. So this allows us to generate a water wave that somehow refracts the background image into something that can fool VGG. Let's check out the results. So um, initially, uh, this is a fox squirrel image, and VGG correctly classifies this one as a fox squirrel, which is a pretty good job. I don't even know it's called fox squirrel. I, just, I only know it's squirrel. And uh, uh, if we add a center, add a ripple to the center, you will see what you see in the center image. But more interestingly, you can actually generate a very subtle water wave that somehow refracts the background image into 
something VGG classifies as a goldfish. This is really interesting. We can use the water renderer to generate a something we call adversarial water wave that can fool VGG. Um, but as a human, you can clearly see it's still a squirrel. So we can easily combine those differentiable modules into uh, very interesting deep learning systems. There's actually one more interesting thing, which is differentiating physical simulators does not always yield useful gradients of the physical system being simulated. It might be a too long sentence, but let me explain what's happening here. So sometimes the gradients can just go wrong. Consider this example, and you have a rigid ball hits a frictionless ground, no gravity, no friction, fully elastic collision. Uh, it's easy to derive the relationship between the initial height and the final height, right? Because you know uh, the the vertical velocity is a constant before and after the collision because it's a uh, fully elastic collision. You know the, the final height and the initial height sums up to a constant, which means that. If you evaluate the gradient of the final height with respect to the initial height, you get negative 1 because their sum is a constant. Uh, however, the differentiable simulator may tell you that the gradient is 1 instead of negative 1. So this is completely wrong. Why is that happening? Well, let's use a larger time step and see what's going on. Uh, because our collision detection is still discrete, it's easy to see the final height actually raises together with the initial height, except for a few discontinuities. So uh, if you do the simulation, uh, if you plot the final height, initial height figure, it's easy to, uh, to get a blue curve. And uh, that's a, you see a sawtooth pattern there. It has a correct tendency, but it's, it has completely wrong gradients. The question is, how can we get the origin curve, which has both the correct tendency and the correct gradient? Well, it's actually pretty easy. Uh, we can just add time of impact, and then by adding time of impact to the to the system, to the simulator, the gradient is now correct. Actually, the time of impact fix is super important, and by doing that, the robot can learn much better from the red curve to the green curve. As you can see, without time of impact, basically it doesn't learn at all. With the time of impact fix, uh, the green curve is doing a pretty decent job. Here's a comparison. Here's a visual comparison of optimizing with and without time of impact. As you can see, without time of impact, the robot doesn't move at all. What if we still use TOI for training, but we disable TOI for testing. The robots still work. So the funny thing is that when only forward is needed, without time of impact, the simulator is already good enough. But if you want to evaluate the gradients, then you do need more fixes to the simulator by adding time of impact. So the takeaways here are differentiating physical simulators does not always yield useful gradients of the physical system being simulated. And uh, maybe an easier description is a simulation good enough for forward may not be good enough for back propagation. So in summary, differential physics and AI, uh, the combination is a very exciting new field. And uh, we have explored Qing Kuen and Diff Tai Chi in this direction uh, with very promising results. And we do enjoy research in this direction. There are many ways to combine differentiable physical modules and deep neural networks. You can use it to speak uh, to speed up learning. You can use differentiable physical modules to help close the seam to rail gap because you can do system identification. You can improve the predictability by doing hybrid simulators where you have both physical modules for the physical part and deep neural networks for the data-driven parts. You can combine those two together. But be careful, sometimes a brute force autodiff does not give you the correct gradient. Consider the rigid collision part we showed you just now. And uh, what, really, what is really important to me is productivity and performance. I really care about those two aspects about physical simulation, and especially how to make physical simulation as simple and available as deep learning is what I really care about. Um, and my solution to improving productivity and performance is on developing programming languages and systems such as Tai Chi and Diff Tai Chi so that we can lower the barrier of writing high-performance differentiable simulators. So that's it. I would like to conclude this talk using a quote from Confucius. Infrastructure is key to success. 
And by building Tai Chi and Diff Tai Chi, we do believe that we can make differentiable physics a more welcoming community, and uh, it will lower the barrier for people to enter this exciting new field. Thank you so much for listening to this talk, and I'm happy to take a few questions. Okay, yeah, hey, uh, Yan Ming's here with us, and I'm just going to start taking questions as they come. So uh, the first questions I'm going to take is from Rocket Chat. How did you train your controllers if you did not use reinforcement learning? Oh, that's a great question. So actually, one of the greatest benefits of uh, differential physics is that we can directly uh, obtain the gradient of the whole physical simulation process. In the process, um, contains not only the physics, but also neural network activations inside the physics. So that's how we backpropagate the gradients uh, all the way back to the neural network weights. And then we can just use brute force gradient descent to somehow uh, optimize for the neural network weights. So this is way more efficient than reinforcement learning because in reinforcement learning, we have to somehow uh, use Monte Carlo methods to estimate the gradient, which is kind of a, uh, which does give you more exploration, but sometimes it's less efficient gradient because there's a lot of noise in the gradients from reinforcement learning. But in differential physics, the gradients are super accurate, so it converges very fast. Thanks. Yeah, just following up on the same question from Santiago, uh, do you see any future directions where RL and differential physics can be mutually beneficial? Oh, that's a great thing. So uh, actually, there are a lot of uh, internal discussions uh, among people who are doing differential physics at MIT. So one issue is that one thing we find that is differential physics tends to converge super fast to a local minimum. And uh, this is sometimes not what people want exactly, because uh, people do want the great exploration feature of reinforcement learning. And uh, on the other hand, uh, I have to admit, uh, differential physics do converge super fast. So it's very meaningful to somehow combine uh, exploration from reinforcement learning and exploitation from differential physics. And at this point, we haven't know uh, a good method that can smoothly combine the good uh, features of RIL and differential physics together to make sure we can get, we're not trapping local minima, we're getting a better uh, or even global uh, minimum for the optimization problems. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, we also have another question, like what, metrics or losses do you usually use to train on your net? Uh, okay, yeah, so that's a more practical question. So we have tried many different kinds of loss functions. Um, sometimes we use L1, sometimes we use L2. Uh, we find that when using L2, because the gradients are accurate, it tends to give you a exponential decay if your loss is approaching, approaching zero, just because uh, the feature of uh, L2 loss. Sometimes we do use L1 if we want uh, the loss to be like, uh, uh, we, if we don't want a decaying uh, op optimization speed when we're moving towards the destination point. Um, and uh, another benefit of using L1 loss is that sometimes you don't have a definition of, it, of a destination. It has to be something, uh, for example, in many of our examples, we just let our robot to move as to the right as possible. And in that case, it's not a single point destination. The goal is to move to the right. And uh, our loss function in that case is just defined to be um, something like the negative x coordinate of the center of mass of the robot. As, as you can see, by minimizing the negative uh, x coordinate of the center of mass, you're trying to maximizing uh, the average center of mass position uh, of all the particles. Uh, and in order to maximize that, your, ro your robot has to move to the right as far as possible. And there are a lot of, uh, I, th I think just like reinforcement learning, other projects we did find that the loss function can sometimes be super useful uh, and super a tuning loss function can be super useful for speeding up your learning process. Um, and uh, Actually, one thing in differential physics is that if your robot, if your loss function is flat, then basically the gradient is always zero, then that means your network is not learning at all. There's zero gradient. Uh, so this is actually kind of a, a different from reinforcement learning because in, if you're doing reinforcement learning, it's actually possible for your uh, 
loss function to have zero gradients everywhere, but you do have a bunch of discontinuities. And in that case, reinforcement learning will still work. But in differential physics, we do want this kind of relatively smoother loss function to make sure that the gradients actually make sense. But on the other hand, yeah, I have to thanks. say, yeah, the gradients, sometimes the optimization is not that sensitive to the loss function. Sometimes it is. It depends on experimentation. So it sounds good. Uh, it seems like there's more questions trickling in, and I'd, I'd love to take them. So uh, how can we regularize and avoid overfitting when we minimize, for example, MSC between observed and simulated trajectories? Uh, so uh, the question is about if there is a target trajectory, uh, how do we optimize our output trajectory, the MSE distance between the output trajectory and the target trajectory, right? Or so I think the question is about, directly? can you regularize and avoid overfitting somehow? But uh, I, a, I suspect that's not the case here. Uh, so right. yeah, so a little bit of clarification, we actually never gen, uh, input a trajectory uh, because uh, we actually expect our system or the soft robots to somehow figure out its own trajectory. Uh, we only tell the robot that our loss function is to somehow maximize the distance you move to the right. So uh, we don't really uh, usually give a hint on the trajectory there. But I, I think that's a actually, actually very meaningful feature direction. So in certain cases, especially for multi-stage control cases, we do find that simply giving a, a single loss function sometimes will keep the gradient descent just a trapping local minimum. And that is not, we want, not what we want. So it might make sense in those cases to somehow give a little bit of hint on what kind of trajectory the controller should follow. Yeah, so we have another question. Uh, the issue with gradients when collisions are involved seems to be related to the fact that impulse space collision resolution introduces discontinuities. But do you think the same issue would arise with penalty-based collisions? That's a great question. So uh, we do find that that situation, the uh, wrong gradients only happen when we are using impulse-based methods. Uh, and we do find that for simulated short stop robots when uh, the collision is more depending on deformation, which is a uh, like something like an elastic potential energy penalty. And also I believe even for, uh, for penalty-based rigid body collision, uh, the gradient discontinuity issue and the wrong gradient issue will not happen. But sometimes uh, using the penalty based method can be a little tricky because uh, getting like if your penalty stiffness is too high, then the system tends to be unstable. If the penalty stiffness is too low, then you get some kind of penetration. So in practice, we do want to uh, either use a LCP based solver in other related work, or we use a brute force uh, impulse based method as we did in Diff Tai Chi. Uh, those are pretty convenient method and uh, get re gets get you rid of uh, one more hyperparameter to tune. So, uh, but the, the, the bad thing about penalty-based or, uh, sorry, the bad thing about uh, impulse-based method is that you have to, you do have to implement the time of impact for a more precise collision resolution. Otherwise you get those uh, incorrect gradients. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, and there's also another question on, would there be exploding or vanishing gradients when you have very long time horizons? Yeah, that's also a good question. And uh, I promise that we did suffer quite a bit from that. Uh, you can just imagine a like a differential physics is not uncommon for people to have over 2000 time steps, especially with the diff tai chi system where uh, we have a, the capability to simulate something like uh, up to 10, 10K time steps there. So one issue, if you consider that to be a super deep RNN, and uh, it's actually significantly deeper than what people usually do in RNNs. And you know, in RNN, there's gonna be something like that's kind of positive feedback of gradients and uh, it can be uh, kind of dangerous to back propagate all the way back to the initial configuration. So uh, we did find something like gradient exploding um, in those situations, especially when we have very frequent rigid body collisions because rigid body collisions can be sometimes uh, pretty problematic and Actually, in many solvers, if you consider you're putting a, in a 2D world, you're putting a box on the, on the ground, many solvers will just treat that there is a uh, constant collision between the box and the ground. And uh, you can, there is actually uh, a little bit of a 
tiny vibrations on the box that you cannot observe. But this is perfectly fine for forward. But if you are doing backward, then those kind of micro collisions happening very frequently will actually give you a lot of issue for gradient evaluation. So we typically give gradient explosion in those cases if the parameters are not properly twinned. I think it's very similar to uh, super deep neural networks than uh, people either have gradient explosion or gradient vanishing. Uh, but we have not really experienced gradient vanishing. So that is because I, I do believe that is because in our physical system, as long as our system is not too damped, uh, physical rules will ensure that there is no gradient vanishing. Uh, we have not experimentally encountered that issue. Uh, for gradient exploding, our solution is very simple. Just normalize the gradients so that uh, you don't get super large gradient that can destroy your neural network waste in, single, in a single iteration. Thanks. Yeah, so I'll just take one more question in the interest of time. And uh, this one's from Kelsey, incidentally. Uh, can you comment on why you focus on explicit as opposed to implicit solvers? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, I think it's mostly a personal choice. I'm not saying that explicit solvers are better than implicit solvers. And uh, there are also a lot of uh, semi-implicit solvers that lies between explicit and, time, uh, and implicit time integration. So. Um, uh, of course, for implicit, sol implicit solvers, one great benefit we can get is that uh, we can use much larger time steps, and uh, that can be uh, that can help improve both performance and gradient stability. And uh, so, but the current issue for utilizing uh, a implicit solver in a lot of systems is that in, auto, in a lot of auto diff systems is that unless you're manually deriving the adjoint system, which is uh, the adjoint method to somehow evaluate gradient uh, using some clear, clever, relatively clever math tricks, uh, having a compiler that automatically derives the optimization under const the gradient of the optimization under certain constraint is not easy. It's not trivial. But for explicit time integrator, it's usually super easy to implement, and the diff type G system can uh, very conveniently just. Uh, use reverse mode auto diff to derive all the gradients. So that's mostly a convenience thing we are considering. Um, and I do believe in the future, uh, explicit solvers and implicit solvers will coexist because there are benefits of both. Um, so there are certain cases where people will prefer explicit solvers. There are, of course, a lot of other cases where people will think implicit solvers or semi-implicit solvers are, are better. So yeah, thanks, Yanming, for the very engaging training session. Thank you and I yep. expect there's going to be more questions trickling in. Just feel free to take them on Rocket Chat. Sure. And we also yeah. hope to see you on the panel shortly. Thanks awesome. so much again. So this is how we're going to run this panel. I, I would like a quick round, quick round of introduction by everybody. And then just, just say your name. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back to each one of you, have you uh, uh, give an open remark on what do you think differentiability is useful and why not the alternative such as just simply computing the gradients. Okay. All right. Um, so everybody knows who's who. Uh, C CJ, do you want to start? Just just say who you are and, and, and you know, where you are. Uh, hi, I'm uh, CJ Taylor. I'm uh, with the Grasp Laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania. Great. Uh, Bethany? Hi, I'm Bethany Lush. I work at Argonne National Lab, specifically at the Leadership Computing Facility, which is our supercomputer facility. Okay, Wami, go ahead. Hi guys, I'm Yuan Ming, and I, I am a fourth year PhD student at MIT CCL. I work on graphics simulation and compilers. Thank you. Um, Andrea? Hi, my name is Andrea Tagliasaki. I'm a research scientist at Google Brain, and uh, I also work uh, at U of T. Okay, great. Peter? Hi, I'm Peter Vitalia. I'm a research scientist at DeepMind. Thank you. Dan? I'm a graduate student in the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience at Columbia, and I came to listen to you guys speaking. All right. And Joanna? Hi, I'm here, but I'm, I'm an organizer. I'm just helping, helping moderate. OK. Kelsey? I'm similarly here, but I'm an organizer helping moderate. OK. All right, so what I am going to do is once we have a very brief introduction, I am going to uh, just pass the mic to each one of the panelists and have each one of the panelists share with us their personal perspective uh, regarding differentiabilities and, you know, versus other alternative approach. Okay, CJ, go ahead, please. Okay, um, wonderful. So I, I guess, uh, 
what I'll do is actually echo a point that I that I heard on in, in your talk because it's it, it resonated with me as at Grasp of Archer here we work a lot on on robots actually stuff at the inter intersection of computer vision and robotics um, and the like so uh, this concept of being, being able to build differentiable models to help us model uh, actual robotic systems that we have so for instance you know these, these legged systems that are that are walking around in extremely complicated environments where we don't have um, uh, wonderful models to begin with. I think it opens up the op opportunity for, for us to uh, both learn models that are better, have better predictive properties, but also uh, allow us to get a control, which is what we really want to do, is how do we have really performant systems that work in, work in a lot of these environments where our existing models are, quite frankly, at this point, uh, less than adequate. Thank you, CJ. That, that's, a, that's a very brief introduction of your perspective. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot of people. <laughs> All right, uh, Bethany, do you, would you like to uh, say a few words regarding what, what your perspective on differentiability and why it is useful and, and you know, what's your view on the pers what's your perspective on sort of compare that to alternatives? Sure. Um, so my background is uh, applied math and I've been working on machine learning for dynamical systems and more recently um, a little bit of fluids. And I have not done any vision just to be clear, but I am learning a lot from you, the rest of you today. And um, I, I really like the idea of being able to integrate your physics simulation with your machine learning as an end-to-end -end pipeline. Um, and uh, I've definitely had personal experience with estimating gradients directly from noisy data can uh, really amplify noise. So it's great if you can um, analytically compute gradients. Um, and something I'm thinking about today is that our supercomputers, we have computers coming that are going to be primarily GPUs. And I'm wondering if um, differentiable physics approaches to simulations could take advantage of the GPUs. I think so. I think it can. Uh, and that's definitely another direction that we, we can move to as a community. Um, OK, uh, Wang Ming, would you like to go ahead and say a few words? Sure, yeah. Uh, so first I would like to answer Bethany's question. So can differential physics leverage GPUs? If the answer is yes, we do have a Tai Chi system that can generate code for both CPU and GPU system. And uh, you write the code in Python, the compiler will generate GPU code for you. So it's an easy way to somehow leverage GPU resources nowadays. And uh, my perspective on differential physics is that, first of all, I really like it. And uh, uh, we have C for certain problems by in, uh, utilizing the analytical gradients, the optimization will just run ridiculously fast. And uh, compared to reinforcement learning, we have clearly a very, very huge advantage here regarding exploitation of existing strategy. But there is one thing uh, that I, I want to highlight, which is uh, according to our experiment, we do find that differential physics tend to get trapped in local minimum just because uh, now we have much more accurate gradients. And if the gradient, if the real gradient is zero, then it's zero, which means you're not making any progress there. So that's one thing. And the other thing I think differential physics can actually help us solve is on more the connecting virtual and reality world side, because nowadays a lot of people, especially uh, robotics people, are really, really interested in how to reduce the same to real gap. And uh, apparently, differential physics allows us to somehow uh, combine the real world data from the real world experiments with the simulation data. And uh, by doing this kind of optimization, we can do hybrid simulators that can close the same to real gap. That's my, my humble point. <laughs> Great perspective. Thank you. Um, Leon, are you, are you there? Yeah, great. Okay. I, we got I, you. I am here, but I, I meant to be just an organizer. I, I, I still have my own opinions about these things, but I, I would prefer to just, uh, maintain my Im impartial organizer status. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, actually talking about organizer, I forgot to introduce one person, but I think that person doesn't need introduction and that's Krishna. <laughs> Everybody say hi to Krishna. Okay. All right. Thank you, Leon. Okay. Um, actually, you know what? If you are here, you cannot escape. We are going to come back to both of our organizers to ask them for their opinion at the end of this. <laughs> but but we, we, will, we will reserve the space for them at the very end, uh, the honorary position. All right. Uh, Peter? Uh, yep. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so I mean, I guess I would say that, um, you know, optimization is, is, is some kind of search process and mm -hmm. uh, differentiability offers really uh, efficient ways of 
uh, you, know, you know, can drive algorithms that are very efficient at searching. Um, and so, like, and I think that's underneath a lot of what you know the benefits of you know, say, different, you know, even just training neural networks uh, with uh, backprop rather than some kind of like reinforced algorithm, right? This is the root of that. Um, but another thing that I talked about in my talk that I think is a, an important thing uh, that we can sort of exploit about differentiability and auto differentiation is uh, like I was showing a few a few uh, projects where we're taking physical relation, like, you know, relations from physics that uh, sort of relate, say, part like the partial derivatives over spatial quantities to the time derivatives, and we can sort of efficiently calculate gradients using jacks or TensorFlow or whatever, and then uh, and put those inside our models so we can sort of exploit these inductive biases from physics um, very easily with a few lines of code, um, and then we can do things like Hamiltonian mechanics um, and sort of you know, build that into our model. Um, and get all sorts of you know uh, energy conservation and uh, different types of generalization that, that we're interested in. And just the last thing I want to say, um, addressing what um, uh, Yuan Ming said about the sharp gradients, I think that an interesting direction we should be um, thinking more about. And I mean, people, people, some people are thinking about this. I think have thought about this for a while. But um, yeah, like these really accurate models with these kind of like very detailed gradients. If we're trying to optimize something, that's not actually what we want to optimize. What we want to optimize is a convex function that ha happens to have the same global minimum as that function, right? So I think that thinking about how to, um, you know, take very accurate forward models or maybe even knowledge of the gradients of those and come up with other models that are going to support more, even more efficient search is, could be, you know, very good for us in the future. Um, so that, that's, that's all I would, I would say. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Uh, that, that's really a, a interesting thoughts. Um, next, I think I'm going to go to um, Andrea. Hi, uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, yes. please. I guess my perspective is a bit different. It's less from the physics side and more from the robust computer vision side, uh, where I both work with uh, estimating noisy gradients from data as well as more analytical gradients from whatever forward process you have. Um, I think the most thoughts in regard, the most interesting thought in regard to this particular topic that I have is actually uh, with, via meta-learning. So I think meta-learners are something that is particularly this year uh, becoming a bit more popular, I guess starting from the vision side in, in being able to estimate gradients by examples. And, and in that sense, basically you have, uh, you have stochastic estimates of, uh, of, of gradients, but then uh, at test time, they actually behave in a very smooth way. So it, it reconnects a little bit to what you're uh, to what Leo was saying a couple of seconds ago um, so that's what I think is, is a, an extremely interesting part is like there is, there is this divide where you could do it by full differentiability or just gradients but it's actually not true there is a continuum in between the two different domain at least in my side of the problems but interesting perspective as well um, great um, so, Georgia, would you like to say a few words? Um, actually, we didn't, we missed your introduction. So please, uh, you know, state your name and, and your, your current affiliations and then, you know, your perspective. Sure. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me and hi to everybody else. Um, so my name is Georgia. I'm a research scientist at uh, Facebook AI Research. Uh, I have been and I am still a computer vision researcher, so I care a lot about uh, computer vision problems, in particular um, object recognition. Uh, and I am an empiricist at heart, so uh, for me, whatever works is great. Um, and so in terms of that and trying to make object detectors and recognition work better and better every day, uh, we have been exploring whether um, differentiability in uh, 3D can help us with understanding 2D um, and not just for 3D tasks. Uh, and this is, I think, uh, my interest and why I have, I am here and the perspective that I have. Uh, it's, uh, the verdict is not out yet. We don't really know uh, how to make our detectors and recognition systems work uh, better. Is it data, um, annotated data? Is it uh, better? representations by going to 3D uh, we is a better optimization. We don't know, but we are exploring. Uh, and this is what I'm interested in. OK, great. All right, so if the organizers are here, they are not escaping. I'm putting them on the spot. Sorry, Krishna, your thoughts. 
So, uh, yeah, like in terms of differentiability or uh, like my thoughts usually were if you've spent years of research just developing, you know, techniques like rendering or multiple geometry or physics simulation, why just throw them all down the drain and like do, I don't know, model free learning. So, yeah, my forays actually started from that perspective. Like, can we somehow try and use all the knowledge that we already have? and instead improve systems rather than like replace them. That, that's where I see differentiability is a very strong scheme, but I don't see differentiability as the end in general. Like I, I think there needs to be a blend of things that you can specify differentiably. And there's always things that you cannot specify differentiably. You need to learn them. So th there's like a hybrid that we need to shoot for. I agree. All right, Liam, what do you think? Uh... So I, I'm a robotics guy. Uh, I'm a prof at the University of Montreal, and I'm actually Krishna's advisor. And so, I mean, the, the hope here is that, I mean, what we've always wanted for representations for robotics is that uh, they're, they're task informed. And I think that um, the real hope here is that the tools of this community uh, can provide us roboticists with methods and methodologies by which we can take performance on an end task on some metric and feed it all the way back to learn perceptual representations. And that's a lot of what the research that, um, that Krishna is doing is about. And I think that this is a super powerful thing. And then I also really like, um, I think it was CJ who was talking about, or, or sorry, maybe Yan Ming uh, talking about this, uh, you know, the sim to real element of this and how uh, now if we can get these back probable uh, tools like physics that we can actually optimize simulators for uh, directly uh, to close this into real gap. This is another like extremely powerful thing that could have real applications for um, for robotics. So I would almost consider myself more as like an end user of most of the technologies that are being created by the panelists in some sense. Great. Okay. All right. So I am wondering if the panelists uh can comment on what do you think, what are the name your dream application that you think can sort of unify, I, I think I already started mentioning some of that in, in my comment uh, when Krishna asked me, what, what are the possible application? So let's kind of start dreaming together. Um, what are some of the possible application that can unify vision, graphics, physics community together that you know different community with different background can achieve together and, and machine learning of course right that cannot possibly do alone by itself so what what are some of the dream possibility and application that you can think of uh you know based on sort of the conversation that we have so far that you think will be really exciting and, and challenging and that actually require vision graphics physics community to work together. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, machine learning, I keep keep dropping it out. Because uh, this is it's kind of taken for granted we you know everybody is using machine learning now. Uh, so how how can we, you know, these multiple community work together to advance one or two or three or whatever X number of application that is not possible earlier. So I'm going to put, you know, I'm going to just kind of go around in a wrong Robin fashion. I'm going to put uh, CJ as the, our first, I'm going to put him on the line and, and ask him to, <laughs> to, to share with us his thoughts. Okay. CJ, uh, go uh, ahead. I think this is actually something that, that, that Georgia picked up on, but uh, this vision, this, uh, no pun intended, uh, the idea of the vision being sort of the uh, inverse problem of, of graphics. Is, uh, is something that I think, you know, is, uh, has been around as an idea in the community for quite a while, but I think the kind of techniques that have been discussed here, where, as you said, there's a, there is a graphics acting as this forward engine, uh, but then allowing us to interpret, uh, interpret images in terms of being able to, to, to uh, um, uh, use these tools to actually pull back out meaningful or salient representations, I think is a, um, could be a fun thing that, that could be a fun thing to take, a, take another crack at. Okay. Um, should I go around one by one or is there anyone who want to jump in? Can I jump in? Yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, so uh, thanks for letting me, letting me jump in. So I uh, actually have, a, have two things on this. I still believe that uh, uh, robotics application will be a really, really great application uh, of what we have developed here, including differential vision, graphics, and uh, differential physics, because uh, I, I think nowadays, um, a lot of robotic applications are still um, based on traditional control methods. And uh, uh, apparently, uh, as we have shown in our recent work in differential physics, we can already just use brute force gradient descent to, on one hand, first uh, make robotics training much faster because uh, now uh, using gradient descent, it converges one or two orders mag uh, magnitude faster than reinforcement learning. And secondly, I do believe that uh, somehow closing the same to raw gap can be one very meaningful application of uh, differential physics because there are just so many ways to inject errors in physical simulators. It could be uh, one model that doesn't really reflect the reality. It could be one wrong physical parameter that is system, system identification. It could be uh, something numerical errors where a new deep neural network can actually correct. So uh, I think those two uh, topics like accelerating learning and uh, closing sync to raw gap are what uh, differential programming is really good at. And uh, I think both of them have great applications in robotics. That's my two things. <laughs> great. All right. Uh, anyone else want to jump in next? Here, I'll, I'll say something. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, so, Peter. I think that I think the most important problem in AI is uh, is con like construction or tool synthesis. So I think partially is because I'm I might be biased, but I think this is also one of the most important parts of human intelligence. I think it's sort of what, in some sense, di distinguishes us from uh, you know other forms of intelligence. And uh, and I think that when when we try to attack the problem, we we start to think about what does it take to you know just to you know, build some building or even just like fix something that's broken in our house. There's you're immediately faced with this enormous search space. And so the question is like, you know, physics is a small set of rules and it can give rise to a tremendous amount of, uh, like it can be realized in an in infinite, in infinity of sort of, uh, you know, different scenes and different scenarios. And how do, so how do we search through that? And how do we sort of find things so quickly that, you know, kind of work and what's that process that we use? And then the reason I think that that can also be sort of tied into graphics and vision is, so there's this, there's this paper I like from um, uh, Sandy Pentland and uh, Ted Adelson from about uh, 25 years ago or so, where they, they're talking about, it's about like uh, sh uh, perception of shading, sort of vision, human vision, perception of shading. And they, they talk about this workshop metaphor. And the idea is like, how would you, it's like this very generative approach to vision. So like the inverse graphics thing uh, was mentioned a minute ago how would you build this scene out of components? Like, how would I build this scene out of, you know, I have a phone here and I have like a book over here. So in some sense, it really is also a construction process, even to form an interpretation of what's around you. Um, and I think that some of the uh, like similar challenges are, are at play here. Um, and, uh, and this is an old idea, right? Of course, like even like people like Irv Rock and perception have talked about this for uh, the logic of perception. But I really think that one thing that we probably could spend more time on in machine learning is thinking about representations that support sort of a lazy, almost sparse generation of structure and of hypotheses or solutions, um, because that's really the, the, how the world is organized and that the problem that one of the most important problems that humans face and that I think we need for AI. Um, I think vision, graphics, and physics have a lot to like, you know, learning and, and exploiting knowledge of these things has a lot to say about that. I agree. Uh, Andrea, Bethany, or Liam? Sure. Um, I guess that from my point of view, like in putting the, the three fields together, right? Um, often I ask myself the question, I look at my daughter and I ask myself, she has, uh, when she was one especially, she can navigate in three space without any problem. She can grab objects, manipulate them, perform significantly better than any robot that you've ever seen. And, and when, I, when I'm looking at her, I'm thinking, what kind of media was she exposed to? Uh, was she exposed to 14 million images, ImageNet, right, with labels, uh, maybe less, right? But then you might ask yourself the question is like, what if you have a, a child that doesn't have verbal communication, like an autistic child, right? Will they be enabled then to, to operate in this space? Um, I'm not an expert in this area, but my, my gut feeling is that that would be uncorrelated uh, from from the ability to perceive and operate in three space. 
And therefore the question becomes, what are we allowed to provide neural networks as inductive bias to actually learn what the world looks like? And, uh, and the more and more I think about it, the more and more I'm convinced that the only inductive bias that you're allowed to use is physics. Um, and, and this comes in the form of either simulation, because you know, these are the laws of the universe, right? You know that they are valid. You know that whatever you're doing, as far as you're introducing them, they cannot be violated because they're, they're just there. Uh, and, and if you look at some of the progress that, that has happened over the last year, uh, some of the biggest advances in, in differentiable rendering, what have they done? They have just respected physics, right? They have respected, for example, modeling of transparent media that was a scene representation network and neural volumes and then uh, NERF, they did exactly that. Uh, they have done um, modeling of light scattering events with light fields in NERF, like, and, and I find this pretty inspiring. And, and, and I think a lot of my agenda right now is driven is like, okay, this is the only, if we are to build the computer vision and, and the differential physics of the future, this is the only thing that I'm allowed to use and everything else is just cheating. And it might be okay for the time being, because you might still build products and, and, and companies and applications, but it's still cheating. It's like, uh, you're allowed only to, to give a network what a two-year-old or a one-year-old has access to. Okay. All right. Uh, do we, Georgia, uh, or actually Bethany, I think Bethany want to say something when, when uh, Andrew. Uh, um, I'm curious if vision um, can be helpful in climate modeling or weather or other environmental problems if we have a satellite imagery to augment incomplete physical models. Um, and something I'm curious about, but I am not knowledgeable of the available imagery data sets. I, I would imagine so. I would imagine so. It, the, of course, climate, it's now you're talking about, you know, large scale eddy simulation. So it's, it's much, much bigger. And, 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 a, and that's a really, that's actually an area of a tremendous potential because we're looking at climate change and at a global scale um, bigger than ever before. Uh, that's a great, that's a really a great application. Yeah, and I will say that yeah, there, um, there has, I, I'm aware of uh, early work that's been done, for instance, in looking at satellite imagery to try to estimate fluid flows and the like, but I, mm -hmm. I can certainly see an application for uh, marrying this with a, with a physical model underneath it to help us right. uh, do a better job uh, of interpreting that kind of data. I think that would be a very profitable um, line of research. Yeah, yeah, and that's really, uh, I mean, that's an area of potential impact at a very large scale. I mean, we're talking about global scale, right? The world scale. Uh, and and it particularly combined with, like I say, large scale uh, eddy simulation that kind of track how the, you know, the fluid flow of atmospheres and how that would evolve together with just century of data. And I think that it would be really kind of interesting. I just don't know anybody is working on that because there's many of the, the work in this area is mostly done by people who are in academia and, and industry research labs. I, I don't know how many, I mean, of course you are, uh, in, in national lab really are <clears throat> thinking about taking the latest research and really pushing it forward, you know, to solve some of these really important problems at the, the national and, and the world scale and, and the earth scale. So that potentially mm -hmm. will be a tremendous impact. Yeah, the national labs are definitely talking about how to use um, machine learning methods on these um, kind of climate um, right. type problems, but I don't know about from the graphics or vision perspective, if anyone's kind yeah. of uh, crossing those fields. I, I, I'm not aware of any. I mean, this is just, I mean, this is why that a panel discussion is so interesting, right? Because we all bring our different perspective. So this is really, really uh, interesting thoughts. Um, okay, that, that is, keep that thoughts. So we'll follow up. Uh, Georgia, would you like to say a few words and uh, what you think are your dream application? Um, Yes, of course. Uh, I mean, a lot of the things that people have said so far uh, also are, um, are part of my interest as well. Um, I'm also trying to, like, just 
from what Bethany just said, um, is always, I think our, we should actually be thinking more um, globally in terms of what it is with these applications and what it could be of impact. Of course, we all want to, you know, build models that operate like the human brain that like they're very intelligent. And this is something that we might achieve, but we also might not in this lifetime. But there is definitely a lot of good gain from uh, making, building models that uh, tackle problems that are beyond the scope, um, like climate change, um, ethics, uh, all these topics that are sometimes less um, brought to the forefront. Uh, so there's something that I, I would like to see more of. I would like to see more attention and more um, examples and more research on these type of, of problems that affect all of us right now. Um, and then uh, like, I think that I would like to, um, based on what Andrea just said, uh, you know, how do we envision of training these systems if we want to reach this golden standard of I have now trained like a human brain or like another brain of that level of understanding? And um, I am not I'm not settled yet as to what is the right approach, whether we, we should sim simulate that how humans learn um, or whether we can take a just different approach. You know, humans have like billions of years to establish how they learn. Uh, it doesn't mean that we need to stick to that. Uh, there might be other avenues, other paths. Not that what we're doing right now is anywhere as effective or as pretty as how humans learn. That's like very far from reality. Um, but these are all sort of the questions that go in my head and what I would like to see us uh, tackle in the future. Great. That's good. That's great. Um, Leon or Krishna? Uh, Leon, go ahead. Do you want to say a few words? Hi, sure. Yeah, like I really, I really like what, uh, what Andrea was talking about. Like I have kids too and looking at your one-year-old and it's amazing. And I also remember seeing these videos of like crows solving in incredibly complicated little problems to get um, to get seeds or whatever the crows eat. I don't know. And uh, what was amazing about those things, particularly to me, was that they all involved notions of intuitive physics. Like they needed to understand that some things flowed, and they or or that they could use a stick and pry something up, or that a rock has weight and that it would actually cause something to happen. And uh, when I saw those videos and I thought about what we can do with a robot, it, it's just uh, like the gap is, is still so large between the state of the art robot and a crow. Like, and, and so, so maybe that's like a little bit uh, disheartening as a robotics researcher, but also I think that, you know, there's such a great opportunity. And I think these, um, these notions of being able to understand physics and uh, you know, and, and I completely agree that like this is the right inductive bias that needs to be like uh, imposed on these problems, but that we can somehow, uh, you know, through through these notions of compositionality and understanding of intuitive phys physics that we can get to the point where uh, where robots could solve kind of something on that scale of, of, uh, of task complexity. So that's for me, that's the, that's the goal. Great. And Krishna, do you want to say a few words? What do you think? What are your dream yeah, applications? Uh, be, I mean, th there's plenty, but to be really brief, I think I'd really love to see all of these communities working together. It seems like a lot of these goals are shared, but the kind of work that happens is very, very disjoint. And th that was the motivation behind this whole workshop to try and see if there are synergies like can the differentiable physics and rendering communities interact. We've already started seeing that uh, a bit and we've also seen synergies between the computer vision and differentiable rendering community. So yeah, I'd like to see all of us working together. Okay, we'll be starting to write joint paper after this, right? <laughs> okay, sounds great. Okay, um, anyone else? Want to, did I miss anybody who wanted to say a few words about what are their dream application? Or even audience? You can always chat. Um, 
Okay. Um, if not, we're going to move on to uh, to the the next question, um, which is, do you think differentiable pipeline or programming will make model free methods obsolete? What do you all think? Anyone want to volunteer to jump in? Yep, I can jump in. Okay. <laughs> uh, so. Um, I think the current situation is, uh, so th I, th I think there are two, two things. The first thing is that uh, building differentiable programming models for everything is not yet possible at this point. And there are still a lot of, uh, a lot of physical phenomena or whatever process that we are able to simulate it forward, but back propagating can be very, very tricky. So uh, that's my point one. And my point two um, is that uh, uh, actually, um, okay, I think I forgot my point too. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump here again when I come up with my uh, when I come up with my point too. Okay. Okay, we'll come back to you. All right, CJ. I guess I have something that's uh, hopefully at least tangentially related. Uh, and uh, I, I want this is in reaction a bit to a point that, that Yuan Ming made, made that I that I, that I really agree with that that uh, um, conquering the symptom real graph is of, is of course a, a primary challenge. But the other thing I would point out is, is that um, the robot that you train for is always different from the robot that you go to the field with. Is you're gonna to go to this field with a robot, there's gonna be a short in the motor, the, the prop is going to be bent, and the model that you, work, that you worked with that you trained so hard with is actually not good on the day. And so I, I, I just want to point at this issue that there's a time scale issue that we need to be able to do this adaptability quickly in the field like the crows do when they're having a bad day. <laughs> But they're able to actually actually snap back into it uh, in in very short order, and perhaps the inductive bias induced by these physics will allow us to to lower that manifold dimension in a way that makes this possible. But practically speaking, for somebody who takes robots to the field, this is this is where things bust break. So it means we need robustness training. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that that's great. This is great. Um, anyone else? Anybody want I to? Say, I mean, yeah, go ahead, Peter. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's. A, I, I sort of hope so in a way, but I don't think so. Um, the, so I, I guess the, the issue is that um, you know if you have like discrete sort of problem spaces and. Uh, you, you're sort of thinking about like discrete actions, search trees, and things like this. This is harder for you know. This is not clear how you're going to sort of exploit differentiable, uh, you know, like functions or pipelines to handle these things. At the same time, I mean, you you know, there's people. There's like a lot of work on um, you know continuous relaxations of sort of discrete things. So I think again, like another. This is sort of in the spirit of the thing I was saying before about. But like you don't really care about the, the sharp function what you actually care about is the thing that you can optimize well again maybe like we can start to think about ways of taking discrete problems state spaces action spaces and, and you know relaxing them or coming up with differentiable functions so we can exploit their efficiency for search and uh solving our problems that way so i mean yeah in general i don't think that in the near term we're, we're going to like model free methods do have a lot of advantages um but but in the long term i think that it's you know it's an interesting thing to even try to challenge I, I, I would agree, uh, but I would love to hear anyone else who have different opinion or even similar thoughts, but they, they may want to add comments on top of what Peter has said. Andrea, I, I think mean, you I, were, I, want to say something. Yes, go ahead. I don't necessarily want to, to put something on top of what Peter, what Peter said, but um, if you look at the at the way in which people have been looking at, at differentiable vision and graphics from the image generation point of view, right? What has it been now? Five years uh, ballpark between the first application of deep learning to to a parameterized version of something that you can render. Um, and as of this year, we are model free, right? So we we still have a model, but this model can be learned in a way that is completely oblivious to what you're actually representing. It has full representation power, and it doesn't matter what you're looking at. It's still gonna be able to do it up to a certain precision, right? So I think that if I were to ask something from the people working on differentiable physics would be, if it was me working, I do have a bit of background in physics, but very little, 
But if it was me, I would ask myself, is like, okay, can I take everything that I know from physics, like stress tensors, and uh, can I take uh, the formation gradients, and can I, can I take Newtonian dynamics, and can I now apply to, to a representation that can be learned completely from scratch without relying on any instantiation of topology of dynamics or anything. It's just like you give it examples and then it just picks it up. And as far as you've exposed it to enough examples, it will be picked up. So essentially the same thing that happened to, to graphics and vision over the last two years, yes, two year and a half, um, according to when you count. But, uh, and I've never seen anything like that. Like I, we, know, we know that these, uh, these perceptron actually represent surfaces, but do we have a, a model for the formation of a, of a surface that, that is actually not represented by a, a mesh or a voxel grid? Or no, we don't. I think that's a super interesting direction where I would be um, thrilled to see some, some progress. Interesting thoughts. Very, very, uh, it's very, uh, I, I, I would agree as well. Uh, Leo or Krishna or Georgia, Bethany, anyone want to follow up? Oh, I mean, did you figure out what your number two was? <laughs> uh, so I, I, I didn't, I totally forget my point two, but uh, probably I can talk a little bit of my point three. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so my point one was about uh, uh, for, for, for certain simulation, it's either non-differentiable or we don't know how to differentiate it. And uh, I think uh, because I also work on the compilers, perspective. So uh, I also care about performance. So uh, it's often the case that uh, for certain simulators that we know how to do very efficiently uh, regarding forward simulation, but for backward simulation, there are some always uh, a lot of like uh, issues on computational efficient efficiency. I think uh, as Professor Lin just showed that uh, certain simulators leaders are just not uh, as efficient as uh, uh, people might think. And uh, also the memory consumption can be uh, one issue. And uh, so that's why I do believe that developing uh, high performance compilers that are more suitable for modern computer architecture and uh, suitable for uh, certain problems is super, super important because um, only if we scale up the simulation resolution to a very, very large scale, can we approximately, uh, can we reasonably good approximate the world. And I actually do have a point four. So um, the point four is why I do think uh, probably sometime in the future, people will like uh, differential physics. So that is basically because I, I do think uh, human brains um, has something like a built-in differential physics inside. Uh, just because uh, recently, you know, there's COVID and uh, uh, when I'm outside, I cannot touch anything. So I can magically, always magically come up with ways to operate uh, stuff without touching anything. One example is that now I learned how to gently operate the elevator using my knees without using my hands. And also uh, if I want to uh, open open the door, I learned how to uh, use my elbows instead of using my hands. So um, if you look at reinforcement learning, it will take a lot of trial and error to, uh, for an agent to learn how to do that. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, if we assume that there is something like a differential solver in, in, my, ma in, my, in my brain, uh, I can just uh, maybe do some mental uh, and model-based attempts, and then I can get some feedback, and the gradient from differential physics will tell me how to adjust to achieve my goal. So I do believe human uh, learn quite, should, should learn actually quite fast, a lot more faster than what reinforcement learning are currently doing. And uh, I learned that lesson from Josh Tenenbaum and he always says that uh, he doesn't believe like, uh, uh, he, he, he does believe that human has very strong power and uh, human learn things very, very efficiently. And there should be a reason. And maybe to some extent that reason is differential physics and we would definitely want to adopt more systems that are differentiable in our learning pipeline so that we can learn much more efficiently. Very, very interesting thoughts. All right, do we have anybody who agree or disagree? Anybody want to follow up on that? That's a very, very interesting thought. Does our brain think like differentiable physics <laughs> or differentiable vision? <laughs> oh, we have a differential, oh, we have a differentiable mind. I guess I could jump in. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Not Georgia. to answer that question. I don't have that answer. Um, but mostly to sort of, it's I, actually, it's a question rather than a statement. 
is how will we know? So how will we know if this is the case? So, and so what I'm trying to get to is, let's say that we focus on this one task and we manage to train a system that maybe does this and figures out just how Yaming said how to just adapt or how to do the same thing in a variety of ways. Um, but we ultimately don't really have a test bed to evaluate whether we've actually learned to think or to perceive or to understand like um, humans. So I guess the question is, how will we ever know whether we're making progress when we are definitely operate as researchers, we operate in a very task driven way. We define little tasks, little goals that we want to achieve. Um, so how will we ever be able to know if we actually have unlocked something? I do have something to say on that, if I am not talking too much. Um, oh, go ahead. Please. Yeah, so I, I do believe that we ultimately we would do something like uh, something like ImageNet for computer vision, and we do need a very very nice physics benchmark data set so that people can be, can have a consensus on at least compare what kind of differential uh, what kind of learning method on differential physics uh, like uh, at least we can evaluate different methods on differential physics. We we need a common evaluation standard so that we can really push the field of uh, somehow combining reinforcement learning and differential physics together. So at this point, uh, I think the issue is that uh, 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 graphic uh, differential physics are um, still somehow maybe mostly in the graphics, uh, graphics and physical simulation community. And uh, this is kind of a, uh, a little bit of isolated from people who are really doing learning and robotics. And I, I, th I do think that's why we need to gather here to talk about future solutions. So uh, I think we really need to make the existing differential physics system easy to use and uh, easy to, easy, easy to uh, benchmark. So that's one very uh, important thing. I do think that uh, the birth of ImageNet as a common standard for evaluating different uh, deep learning system has drastically pushed forward the recent advances of deep learning. Like without a uh, common consensus of, of which method is better, we cannot make, uh, we cannot push things forward. We do need a good evaluation things, uh, thing. And uh, currently the issue is we don't have, we haven't built that uh, uh, common standard yet. And I do look forward to uh, something like uh, the ImageNet, uh, something that corresponds to ImageNet to appear in the field of differential physics. That, that's, that's definitely a really interesting thought. And, and I would argue the same probably would apply to even robotics where RL has been used extensively. Um, so we don't have exactly a set of benchmark for robotics community, even though there is sort of a standard list of 12 different robotics, you know, categorizations of grasping, planning, control, and manipulations, you know, and sensing perception and so on. So there really isn't a set of benchmark even for robotics. Although, although that due to differentiable physics, now robotics community is using more simulations and they're sort of starting to have this, you know, like the ants, uh, the, the walking dog, you know, the mobile robots. So there are some of these models are coming up. So uh, I, I do think there is a lot of potential there. Um, and, and vision, it's sort of tying currently to ImageNet, but in the real 3D world where you really need 3D vision, Im ImageNet is still inadequate, right? Because this, the 3D world is much bigger than what ImageNet has captured. But that's really a tremendous bench, you know, it comments that I think that we do need some sort of benchmark in every single community. And that's definitely worthwhile to sort of explore. Now, do we have anyone else who's want to comment on whether we think that differentiable pipeline is going to make model free methods? Absolutely. I think, I think there is some sort of consensus here. The question, it seems like the answer is no predominantly. Am I, am I correct? Or do you have, do we have somebody who want to argue otherwise? No. It, 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 we, we are going to make uh, the differentiable pipeline is going to make model free methods absolutely. I haven't heard that yet. Okay, if not, we're going to move forward and say, well, how, how, do you, how do you see differentiable method being used and apply in the wild? Anyone have thoughts on this? Do, do you think we are ready? Do you think we, we, how robustly can they run? Do you think? 
So I don't have thoughts, but I have context to just add here. Particularly in terms of, let's say, differentiable physics, there are things that you can never hope to model, maybe disturbances like the wind or so, or you know, there might be very complicated objects that you can't always encode in, you know, code. And even in rendering, you're always faced with something that's different from the real world. There, there's always some residual you can't hope to close in. So I guess that that's a very interesting thing to consider. Like, do we want these systems to run ready, you know, in the wild on uh, real data? Or do we look at other midterm transfer uh, solutions like, you know, your training simulation and then try simply real transfer? I don't know, yeah, just opening up more thoughts. So just some random thought. Um, so maybe surprisingly, um, I have to say in many fields, even for physics simulators, are not accurate enough. There are many reasons people can introduce errors in forest physics, including uh, like uh, discretization errors and uh, inaccurate um, model assumptions, and also uh, wrong boundary conditions and inaccurate physical properties. There are uh, many um, issues, even in forest simulation. So I, I think given that, it's fine to tolerate some uh, current law issues of uh, different rule differential physics or differential programming tools and, uh, and adopt that in current learning system because um, there are a lot of issues in forest physics simulation, but there are a lot of, a lot of people already using forest physics for uh, computer aided engineering, for uh, reinforcement learning. So I think uh, we are, I, I wouldn't say we're hundred percent ready, but I think what, what is exciting in the academia is that uh, people are always eager to uh, try new things. And uh, that's why uh, we call it research. Yeah, Here, Peter? I'll say something. So, um, yeah, so like, I think that um, this is something I think about a lot, like, you know, how we're gonna take, a lot of the stuff I showed, you know, we're taking these simulators and we're training some neural network on to, to you know, mimic a simulator, but that's like sort of easy compared to having something that learns about the real world. Um, and I feel like I haven't really had a, sort of come to a decision about how we should approach this problem in general. So one thing I've been thinking of recently though is like, so I think just to say like as background, I think a lot of times like for a while, I think like how do we turn the world to, you know, what we perceive their eyes into objects and you know, different things that you actually find inside a, a physics engine, because that's what we need our models to do. and the more, more lately I've been thinking something different a little bit that instead of thinking about it like as like it's just it's just a series of representation transformations so we have like whatever our sensors are collect some image you know grid like maybe a regular grid of little pixels whatever volumetric data whatever it is and the question is really just how do we stage like how do we uh, you know have a stage of transformations into representations that uh, we want. And what I mean by want is like the thing that's going to help with our downstream tasks, like we was discussed before, or like the efficient computation or efficiently learnable. So I think that I'm really starting to think about kind of like, um, you know, resource rational or kind of like, you know, economically rational, uh, you know, way of thinking about how we can just go right from the sensory data all the way through representation and really try to bring in cost of computation, cost of learning, and the cost of whatever your, you know, task cost is. And the last thing I'll sort of say on this is, I think it's kind of interesting to think about what scientists do. So like a physicist has a model of, you know, the uh, universe or something. And, or, 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 you know, at any scale, you know, a, a model of water and particles and things like this. So like, what, like there's not actually, you know, atoms. Like this is just a representation that's very convenient for us to compute and it like solves lots of problems and we can kind of like extrapolate really, really well. So I think it's kind of interesting to just think about the different trade-offs through science and the, the models that are very prominent, effective and powerful why those trade-offs for me and you know from that sort of get ideas about how we can start to structure our kind of like you know, again economically rational choice of representations computations um where we're, where we're going to take our observations you know of the world and turn those into models because so it's really sort of the same thing um, that's all <laughs> I, 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 I think that's, that's really uh that's, that's correct. And, um, and, and I think the parallel 
a pillow analogy is probably like autonomous driving, right? We are putting these neural network train uh, learning to drive module on the street dealing with the real world. Uh, and, and most of these scenarios are all capturing the very clean data uh, using very clean model. And now it has to be tested on a while. And so I, I, I don't think, you know, it, it will take a lot of learning, but, but I, I, I do think that this is really sort of very interesting things for us to kind of think about in terms of a sort of building on top of what you learn and, and your model doesn't have to be perfect. It, it learns to improve itself through the process. Uh, do we have anyone else who's want to comment on this? Sure, maybe I'll say a few words. So, I mean, I think it, in the, so the question was like, is this ready for the wild? And I mean, there, there are some things that are already out in the wild and they evolve differentiation. Uh, yeah. But I guess what we're talking about is like adaptive models that are learning intuitive physics. And can we put those things out in the wild? And I, I mean, I think for, for a safety critical application like autonomous driving, the answer is like a resounding no. Uh, we're, we're not there. And I mean, I think that the state of the art in autonomous driving is like, yeah, there might be some neural networks in there, but they're put in these nice cages where they can't do a lot of harm to the things around them. Uh, and, you know, we, we don't, we, I don't, I don't know, you know, I'm not, I don't pretend to be like an expert on every single, what every single player in the autonomous driving industry is doing, but not very many of them, uh, you know, actually have, that I know of, have like learning systems that are actually controlling the actuation directly. Uh, the, the, like the thing that is very commonplace now is to have like a learning system that's doing some, some perception. And I think that part is like, you know, relatively solved. Uh, but the, the people who are doing like RL for autonomous driving or, you know, any kind of like kind of model that's a learning based paradigm that's actually being handed the keys to like, pardon the pun, to like uh, actually push the puddles and turn the steering wheel, like th those are extremely rare. We're still using our traditional good old fashioned engineering and models for, for those pieces. And I, I don't know when the tide will turn or if it will turn. My sense is that, uh, the way that this is likely to go is that we like we want to build on a on a strong scaffolding of things that we that we know to be true and that we and and that we can write down like theoretical principles about and guarantees and then the adaptive part is like the sprinkling that goes on out outside of that scaffolding uh, I think that's that's kind of the a more promising um, direction. Uh, particularly for like safety critical systems. When it comes, when you take out the like safety critical nature, you can sort of do whatever you want. And then you can like throw any kind of crazy neural network solution at your thing and see if it works or, or, or not. Um, but for safety critical stuff, like it's, it's going to be, I think a really, really hard battle and a, a long time before we see like these kind of models actually in charge where they can affect like real people's lives. I will totally agree with you. <laughs> Putting into the wild doesn't mean that we're going to put everything into the wild, but it can be used on some application. Definitely safety critical. No, even autonomous driving, it's not approved in California yet, right? Even though we have all these autonomous driving cars. It's largely, I think I, I heard it's, it's on a fairly constrained environment. Uh, it has the potential. Okay, anyone wants to comment on it? CJ, you well, are muted. I, I, it's, it's, Liam raised a, 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 an excellent point. Uh, and I'm wondering if that then means that uh, looking at, at systems that would work with uh, the wealth of information we have from control theory, where we do have guarantees and we do have, we do, we can make bounded uh, assumptions where um, uh, the learned aspects are allowed to, to operate, but within a band that we know is, is safe based on analysis. Um, might be a profitable way for us to, to move forward on this. Yeah, there's some really nice work in this area actually by uh, Angela Scholig at the University of Toronto, who does like, is, a, is an expert on like control and, and writes down her, like her nice little tight, robust like control loop, but then thinks about how to build the 
learned components that are outside of that. Uh, and so now we can have like RL that's learning an inverse model, but that model is still being fed into like a, you know, a control loop that we can do things like have, uh, you know, the same guarantees so, uh, about performance and things like that. So there, I think there is like in the safe RL community, there's, there is some nice work being done in this area. Okay, great. Anyone else want to comment on this? And actually closely tied to that. Let's say that we can put some of these systems in the wild. How do you initialize these systems? Much of these, you know, simulator, render, vision algorithm requires some sort of initialization. What are the way to address this issue? How do you initialize these systems? either in the wild or even in a laboratory environment or control environment or just a simulator? Uh, how, how, do, how do we initialize? Do you have these problems? I do actually believe that differential physics can have a little bit of benefit on initializing a experiment because um, like I, I do believe system identification would be a very nice application of differential physics then you can basically, based on your observation of uh, something like two elastic balls colliding with each other, doing, and then you do a bunch of gradient descent. It's kind of, uh, you can always infer something like the mass ratio between the two balls. And uh, we did have that in the Chin Queen paper as a in, uh, motivating example for system, uh, system identification. So that allows, actually, allows us to actually uh, get a little bit of uh, information from the physical world to the simulating environment by somehow either looking at the, uh, at, at the physical world or use some sensors to gather some information and then fit a model. So um, that is, uh, this is actually one of one, uh, one area where differential physics would actually has a little bit of advantage. Great, yeah. I think Andrea was gonna say something. Yeah, I mean, this is a bit on the wild side though. I, I, I put this prefix on it, uh, but it connects to what, something that Georgia was saying earlier, right? Like, humans had a long time to learn how to behave in the environment. And, uh, and now you can actually even go to the, to the animal world where the, the claim is not as wild, but there is behavior that animals have that are driven by instinct. And now you, you have to ask yourself, what is instinct? Because uh, instinct is, uh, is nature, is not nurture, and therefore is pre-programmed in the brain. So, and this ties to your, what initialization do you give to the system? So, it's not unconceivable that our uh, visual system and our motion control system are somewhat weakly initialized to nudge you in the right direction. I do not know to, a degree, to which degree, but definitely in terms of just behavior, instinct is exactly that, right? Like um, just born animals know what to do without any supervision immediately, right? There is a uh, fawns that just uh, come out of the, the belly of their mother and just start walking. and how do you explain that if there's not some form of memory uh, passed down through generations? So, but again, this is wild, right? In the sense that we have no idea how to model this. And this will mean like some form of memory in between generations of networks that you train. And the closest thing to it will be like federated learning where you have this um, remote model that you update slowly over time. But uh, I think it's pretty interesting that it's, it's completely wild. It's like, I have no idea what, uh, I have no theories on, on how to do it. Well, on that thoughts, any, unless anyone else is on that, have comments that I think that's a, that's a really interesting thoughts that I think we can sit on and think about, uh, and we'll come back next year and we can debate on this, um, or we can debate over drink afterwards. Uh, okay. Um, I, I would love to follow up with, you know, each one of you individually, we have some really interesting discussion. Uh, I think Georgia has to leave already. Um, also we have poster presentation coming up. So uh, I, I would like to sort of, uh, you know, ramping things down. I want to thank you all for an extremely interesting and stimulating and, and exciting discussion on all these really interesting uh, questions. And I, I, I wish we had more time. Uh, unfortunately, we, we already kind of running behind schedule and the poster presentations are waiting. So I want to thank you all for taking your time to uh, chat uh, on this panel format. It has been fun. And uh, I also want to thank Krishna and, and Niyam again for, for organizing the workshop. Um, 
So we will follow up uh, through emails or other, uh, you know, informal discussion offline. Thank you all for participating in the panel and thank you all for all your interesting contribution and, and sharing your thoughts with us in this panel. Uh, there's also Joanna and Kelsey yeah. who are the and, like and, real organizers. I didn't really do much. And then there's other organizers sorry. who are not even here like Victoria. And Victoria, Kelsey, and Johanna, I think really shout out to them. It is they who did like a ton of the heavy lifting. I was probably just, you know, the face, but you know, they, they did all the work and it was really nice trying to put this together and it was nice to just go through all of your talks and have this panel discussion. And yeah, thanks so much for contributing and thanks for joining, taking the time. And I know it's pretty late in a few time zones from where people joined in. For instance, like Peter, uh, it's, it's probably too late for him. And yeah, thanks so much. We're soon going to start off with a poster session on Gallotown. So if any of you just wants to hang around, you know, chat, uh, anything light, uh, feel free to join us. And uh, we've got very interesting submissions to feature in the poster session. I guess Johanna will do a quick two minute walkthrough of how the Gallotown looks like. All right. Thanks so much again. Thanks everybody. Thank you.